Good morning, everyone. My name is Peter Fahm, and I have the privilege of being the director of the Atlantic Council's Africa Center. And on behalf of our chairman, Governor John Huntsman, and our president, Fred Kemp, I'd like to welcome you to the Atlantic Council for this morning's conversation. It's really a privilege uh, and really a distinct uh, pleasure to this morning be able to welcome Pastor Yvonne Mawawiri uh, here to the Atlantic Council. Yvonne is a Zimbabwean pastor of a small church in Harare. And until April of this year, uh, I'll admit, he was not widely known to uh, even within his country, let alone to those of us who follow uh, African affairs uh, or otherwise outside of the country. He wasn't a political figure or an activist. In fact, his identity uh, as an average citizen of that country is probably fundamental to uh, the This Flag citizens movement gaining the widespread traction that it has throughout his country. Now known to all of us through this trademark Zimbabwean flag draped around his shoulders, Yvonne's face is familiar, particularly those who have been following events unfolding in Zimbabwe in recent months. Uh, we all know how out of his frustration uh, at the corruption, the injustice, and the poverty experienced in Zimbabwe, Yvonne took to social media to express his disappointment at the lack of progress made in the country since independence. To quote uh, Sam Power, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., the country that was once the breadbasket of Southern Africa, becoming a basket case over the course of those decades. And the movement that began spontaneously after a video that Yvonne posted on social media went viral. Since he began to speak out, he suffered the consequences of calling the government to account. Following the nationwide shutdown initiated by the citizens' movement, he was arrested. His house and office were searched with a warrant that curiously claimed that he had stolen a button. Uh, I knew things were bad in Zimbabwe. I didn't know they were that bad. Uh, subsequently corrected, I believe, uh, spelling error, I guess, on the part of the authorities. Uh, despite consistently calling for nonviolence, he's been charged with inciting public violence, later charge changed to subverting a constitutionally elected government. And I suspect of the news coming out of Harare in the last 24, 48 hours is to be credited, uh, you'll be shortly charged with being a cyber terrorist, which makes you a first at the Atlantic Council. We've hosted many discussions on cyber terrorism here. We've never actually hosted a cyber terrorist. <laughs> uh, anyway, thousands of peaceful well-wishers have gathered around the courthouse when you were arrested and brought to trial, uh, waiting for the verdict. and you were uh, subsequently released uh, when the magistrate threw out the absurd charges. We're very privileged, uh, Pastor Vaughn, to have you here, not only because you've ignited the hope of many Zimbabweans who rediscovered the courage to make their own individual voices heard, but also you've re reignited, I think, in those of us who followed this country from afar, our own belief that perhaps somehow some sort of peaceful transition uh, is possible. And for that, we thank you. Uh, you're, you join us here on the stage. Uh, following a number, we've, uh, our mandate at the Atlantic Council's Africa Center has been to promote prosperity, promote stability and security in Africa through greater geopolitical partnerships uh, with the peoples and the nations of Africa. And certainly that comes in the peaceful transition Zimbabwe certainly falls within that mandate. We've had in the past the pleasure of hosting everyone from government ministers to members of parliament to members of the opposition here, and it's now our privilege to welcome you as a representative, not of a political movement per se, but really of the aspirations of a people who've been uh, longing for some time for peaceful change and progress. So, Pastor Vaughn, welcome to the Atlantic Council, and the floor is yours. Wow. I, uh, if three months ago you had told me that 
I would have to speak on behalf of my country. Or if you had told me three months ago that I would have to run from home overnight, if you told me that my family would be accosted in the middle of the night at home, if you told me that my kids would be watched at a school as my wife picked them up, I, I really, would have, I really would, have, would have asked that you have a medical checkup of some sort because there was no way that I could ever have planned what has happened. Let me first of all start this morning by acknowledging the presence of my fellow citizens of the beautiful nation of Zimbabwe. Thank you so much for standing for your nation. Thank you for raising your voices. From thousands of miles away, we heard the voices and we felt the passion and felt the unity. And we're so excited that distance means nothing now to you and me. And that we've learned that we can be one and that we can stand for what we've always believed. And that you and I communicate to each other now in ways that people that are far removed from the reality that we live in don't understand. You and I have hidden a Zimbabwe in our hearts for so long. It has felt like a crime to feel like Zimbabwe can be better than the one we have. And sometimes you and I have taken a peek into our hearts to look at the Zimbabwe we long for. And we quickly hide it. And when we've had the chance to take it out, when we're on our own, at night when we get back at home or when we watch our kids sleeping and you wish to yourself that if only Zimbabwe could be the kind of nation that it is supposed to be. I believe that we're standing at the cusp of the opportunity that allows us to see this beautiful nation become exactly what it is supposed to be. Let me also take this chance to thank the citizens of the world that have allowed us to be able to congregate here today and tell our own story through our own eyes, with our own voices. When I think about Zimbabwe and I think about where we've come from, I think about the fact that my grandfather went to war against colonialism, and so did my father as a young man. And those two men did not see what they fought for. And they gave birth to me, and I haven't seen what they fought for. And I've come to a place where my children, my five-year-old and my three-year-old, have to see the kind of Zimbabwe that my forefathers believed in when they went to liberate our country. I made the decision that I will not allow the people that took my father's dreams to take mine. They have taken mine, I'm 39 years old, but they can't take my children's dreams. You can't do that. You have to forgive me, I'm so passionate about Zimbabwe. <laughs> And sometimes you have heard about Zimbabwe, but you hear it through research. You hear it through statistics. You never get to see the tears. And sometimes the tears are necessary for you to understand that for us, it's not about votes. It's not about, it's just about life. It's just about wanting to be free in our own country. It's about me wanting Zimbabwe to be the best place for a Zimbabwean to live. I have friends that say to me, you cry too much. Please don't cry when you go to the... <laughs> but this is what's happening in Zimbabwe. We're crying. We can't suppress the tears anymore. We've been taught for so long to be cosmetic about what we're going through, to put up a bold face, to always make a plan, but we can't do that anymore. And that's what caused me to stand up. That's what has caused me to be able to raise my voice and say, I don't know what may happen to me, but I cannot justify my silence anymore. The Bible, which is, which is, which is a force that drives me, it says in James chapter number 1, verse 27, it says true religion that God our Father accepts is to fight for the widows and the orphans. 
Zimbabwe has the unenviable record of a rising number of orphans because moms and dads are dying before they can see their children grown up and enjoy the sweet spot of Zimbabwe. And they're dying of diseases that can be cured. They're dying because they have no access to, 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 to good health. They're dying because there's no, they don't have decent incomes to look after their children. And so as a pastor, I, I cannot justify my silence anymore. When men and women sleep on the street, and the irony of it, it's not just a street, but in Zimbabwe, there's a road that is named after our president, Robert Mugabe Street. And on Robert Mugabe Street, every night at 7 p.m. going onwards, hordes of vendors, of old senior citizens, old women, sleep in that street together with their grandchildren because their daughters and their sons have traveled to lands afar off to work for their family. So grandma must sleep with that child on the street, not because she doesn't have a home, but she wasn't able to make enough profit. She couldn't make 25 cents. She couldn't make 50 cents on her five, six tomatoes to be able to go home and come back the next day. So they sleep in Robert Mugabe Street. That is where the, 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 the reality of what our nation is going through can be seen, in a road named after our own president. And we are rising up to say that our government has failed us. We're not afraid anymore to raise our voices because it is the truth. The citizens of Zimbabwe are the missing link. We are the missing voice. We are the voice that has not been present in the timeline of building Zimbabwe. And we've realized that. Over the years, we have called on, on, on foreign powers. We've called on the African Union. We've called on SADC. We've called on all sorts of people to come and help. And whilst we are glad for the help, we realize that nobody loves Zimbabwe more than a Zimbabwean. We have to be at the forefront of pushing our country in the direction that we want it to go. We cannot expect anybody else to do this work for us. And so what began as an accident has today become a voice. And I'm glad that it's not about me. I'm glad that my fellow citizens realize that it's not up to one person and it's not about him. He may have spoken out first, but every one of us are responsible for where our country needs to go. And so we began by a simple video that I posted one day as I sat in my office and I was so frustrated at the situation. I had failed to raise school fees for my children and still haven't been able to raise those school fees. But the reason why I sat there and recorded that video is because I looked at a small flag that sits on the desk in my little office in Harare. And I thought to myself, this flag makes a promise to me as a Zimbabwean. But what the promise stands for in the state of my nation are so far apart. I felt like this flag was a fraud. I felt like the promise had been compromised. I felt like what everything this flag stands for is something that, that is a promise that has been broken. But it also dawned on me in that very same moment of frustration as I lamented the fact that my country seemed to have stood in the way of my dreams. It dawned on me that I'm the one that's responsible. I'm the one that's responsible for helping Zimbabwe to regain an honorable place amongst the nations of the world. I realized that me and my fellow citizens, wherever we went, we would hide when we saw the Zimbabwe flag. That we would, we would keep silent and hope no one noticed us when people were talking about Zimbabwe and what was going on in Zimbabwe. We were so ashamed. But now the idea is that you and I must stand. You and I are the ones that will represent Zimbabwe better than any politician whatsoever. Because we live the life every day. We're the ones that face what goes on in Zimbabwe every single day. And so today, I really come to join my fellow citizens to, to tell that story of Zimbabwe, to tell how we're turning it around, and to invite anyone who wants to help us to come and do so on the condition that you are helping the citizen, that you are hearing our cry, you hear our story, and you understand where we come from. But if the world was never to help us, if there was never be going to be anyone that would come to our rescue, we want the world to know that we have discovered that we are the heroes that we have been waiting for.
I'll end my opening remarks this morning by letting you know that I am not a man of vast educational assumptions. But I do know when I'm hungry. But I do know when I can see that my future is being destroyed. And this one statement encapsulates how we started and how we carry on today. And it simply says this. It says if we cannot, if we cannot cause the politician to change, then we must inspire the citizen to be bold. And that's our rallying cry. Because all we have as citizens is each other. And we're discovering that our power is in our numbers. We're discovering that the tenacity that we had to ride through tough economic times must now be used to face our own government who won't listen to us. And all we have said is that they must be held accountable. They have threatened us. They have arrested us. They have beat us. As early as a couple of hours ago, my countrymen in Zimbabwe were today demonstrating against the cash crisis and the bond notes that want to be introduced. And unarmed citizens were beaten. We want our government to know that they will beat us some more. They will jail us some more. But we will only get stronger. We are not going to stop. Because a generation is now on their hands that has had enough. We've drawn a line in the sand that says we will hold you accountable. If we voted for you, then we will ask you the tough questions. And so I ask that even as we discuss this morning, you do so with the thought that my brothers and sisters on the ground in Zimbabwe face a very harsh reality. My very presence in the United States is courtesy of citizen number one in Zimbabwe, who himself said people like Mawarire have no place in Zimbabwe and that he must leave. But that is my home. And nobody, absolutely nobody, including the president of the Republic of Zimbabwe, can ban me or any other citizen from home for standing up for what we believe. I close my remarks by saying what I said in response to the president the first time he asked me to leave. And I said, there are many things that you can do, Mr. President, but there are two things that you are powerless in this season to do. You cannot stop your sun from setting, and you cannot stop mine from rising. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor Vaughn, for those remarks, uh, very inspirational remarks. I think you left us with a great deal to ponder, and I think any of us will carry some of those sentiments out with us and apply them, uh, not only in the case of Zimbabwe, which we know is close to your heart, but really to many other nations in Africa. Uh, your, your comment about if we cannot convince the politicians, then we have to inspire the citizens to be bold. I think that applies in very many places, so thank you for bringing that voice. Now to moderate and lead this conversation for, by the way, I, uh, uh, I neglected one of my obligations earlier as Hector to inform you that if you're uh, tweeting out or engaging in social media or cyber terrorism about this event, uh, the hashtag is uh, ACZIM, so ACZIM, so, but, um, Apologies for neglecting that earlier. Very delighted to have facilitate this conversation. Uh, the newest member of the team here at the, the Atlantic Council's Africa Center, a uh, person who really worked hard over the course of the last few weeks to pull this event together along with the other members of the team. Uh, Chloe McGrath is a South African Fulbright grantee who recently joined us as a visiting fellow to develop our Southern Africa work and to reinforce it. We had decided that we needed to build up uh, uh, because of what was going on in Zimbabwe, but also what was going on in other countries in Southern Africa. We re needed to reinforce our work in that part of the continent. 
Uh, Chloe grew up in Malawi. She's worked in South Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, and Zimbabwe in a variety of research and consulting positions. Uh, she's followed very closely the events unfolding in Zimbabwe and recently for those of us who are Washington insiders, wrote a very uh, powerful and uh, I think very good piece in foreign policy explaining the significance of uh, the hashtag this flag movement. She's also, when she was previously here with us uh, during her graduate studies as an intern, she was uh, she already as an intern showed extraordinary promise. In fact, she wrote the case study uh, on external support for nonviolent civil resistance movements in Zimbabwe for the Atlantic Council's Strategic Foresight Initiative's Future of Authoritarianism project. So, uh, so we're really delighted to have her back, and and I delighted to turn the floor over to Chloe to uh, moderate this discussion with Pastor Yvonne. Chloe. Thank you everyone for being with us today. It is a great privilege uh, for us at the Atlantic Council to host Ivan Mawarere with us today. Um, and thank you Ivan, for sharing your heart with us. I think that is something that we all resonate with massively. So it's been, thank you for being vulnerable with us. Thank you very much, thank you. So I just wanted to start by asking you, it seems that you became an activist in some ways by mistake, if you don't mind me putting it that way. Um, and I know a lot of people have, have wondered what is so significant about this moment. There have been many times when we've thought that there was a chance for change. Um, we look at the 2008 elections and the kind of uh, excitement that there was around that, specifically when the parallel vote tabulations mm. showed that uh, the opposition had won the election. Um, so what is it about this specific time in Zimbabwe's history that has given this, tra this flag so much traction? I think there's, a, there's from my perspective, there's a, a, couple, of, uh, a couple of things that have, have taken place. Um, first and foremost, the, the growth of the demographic of millennials um, is something that I think Zimbabwe didn't really watch out for. And these are a group of people that have such a passion for Zimbabwe that maybe we haven't seen in a long time. Maybe we haven't seen this passion since the War of Liberation. And so these people, number one, are, very, are fearless. And secondly, they, are, um, uh, they, they connect very easily. Mm. So couple that with an opportunity to express your discontent, uh, and, and you get something that's explosive. So the difference is in that there is a, you know, the citizens, just regular people like myself, have finally decided that I have nothing to lose because I've lost everything you know, as it is, and I'm about to lose more. And um, I remember one of the flashpoints over the last couple of months as we have been, you know, protesting uh, the bond notes, mm -hmm. which are, you know, a currency that the government wants to introduce in Zimbabwe, and they say that it's going to be one-to-one -one with the U.S. dollar, but it's backed by nothing. And, you know, and, I'm, and, and I think for, for, for the regular citizen, they're thinking to themselves, what are you, how stupid do you think we are? And please forgive me if I'm not politically correct, because I'm just, I'm not, I'm, I, I just, I don't move in those circles where you have to be careful about certain things. So, so, okay, thank, thank, thanks very much. So some things might happen that you're not, you're not too comfortable with, but we, we, I, we just got to the point where everyone said, wait a minute, how stupid do you think we are that you want to introduce a note that has got no value, and it's going to take everything that I have saved, uh, and you, this is the second time you've done it, and you, want, you, just, you just want me to be quiet? Mm. So, and even when people have spoken sometimes to us as citizens when we've been protesting, they say, you know, you're too emotional, you need to calm down, you need to put your, uh, you know, your complaints across in a more formal manner in a more, uh, and, I, and we said, no, the time for formality is done, it's over. It's okay for our emotions to come out. It's okay for us to, because that's all we have left to, you know, to show. They've taken the shirt off our backs, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. So I think what's different right now is that there is a passionate group of people who understand the issues, 
who also are refusing to be hoodwinked by our government, who are refusing to be sidetracked in terms of what the real issues are. And I think, as you can see, no matter what the propaganda is, we stick to what the issues are, corruption, injustice, and poverty. You know? And so that's, I think for me, that's the differentiating factor, the fact that you have a group of young people that have said, we've just, we're done, we're done with it. We're not afraid anymore. And when we started, our mantra is, in Shona, it's our tichada and our tichachka. You know? In Debele, it's, it's asafu ninjala sesab which means we, don't, we, we, we are fed up and we're not afraid anymore. We're not afraid to stand up. We're not afraid to tell you the truth, no matter who you are, because we have a constitution that allows us to speak uh, you know, truth to you. So that is, has, really made, has really made the difference. But let me also finish by saying this. Part of the difference is that the older generation in Zimbabwe, the men and women that secured freedom for us, have also felt for a long time that enough is enough. And they didn't know which way to say it and how to say it. And when our generation has provided that voice, they've backed us up. And I'm excited about the fact that there is a convergence of generations. There is a consensus with the generations. And there's a consensus across political divides, racial divides, and tribal divides that, no, this is not going to happen anymore. So, 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 you know, so we're done. So we have an unprecedented level of unity in Zimbabwe. And that is exciting. Very, very exciting. Thanks for sharing that. So could you outline for us how the movement went from this one video that you posted on social media to the streets? What, was the, what did the period of transition look like? Because I know a lot of people sort of dismissed it as a social media fad, didn't think that it would actually have a lot of impact. Uh, could you explain a little bit to us how that process took place? You know, to be honest, it, 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 this is the first time I'm admitting this, much to the excitement of uh, one Jonathan Moyo in Zimbabwe. Um, it, it, it did start as a fad. And that's what it just was. It just was, hey, let's do something on social media that's going to be fun. But he ridiculed it. And he laughed at us. And he called us names. At that point, it started to change. And this is the thing with Zimbabweans that we are all aware of. That our government, whenever we have raised certain points or whenever we've complained or whenever we try to hold them to account, they treat us as if we don't think. They, they, they say things like, well, you are Western funded. You are, you are Western founded and Western funded, like Jonathan Moy said. And I thought to myself, what is so Western funded and founded about the fact that I can't send my kids to school? What is so Western funded and founded about the fact that pensioners who built this country C can only access $20 a month of their own money. What's so Western funded about the fact that the government in which you are a part of, Jonathan, went ahead and looted the funds of people that worked hard, and you think it's okay for us? And so that began to, I mean, other, we had other encounters with other government ministers who ridiculed us. Some of them even accosted me. I went to a radio station for an interview. And at that point, at every point that the government attacked the, the, the citizens who were showing their love for their country, it grew more and more people realized that, wait a minute, this, we, we can't be treated like this anymore. Mm -hmm. So we started off with the one video. And after that, I started to talk about, hey, if you love Zimbabwe, why don't you get your flag with you? Take a selfie, post it on social media. And that began to grow. And then eventually we went into saying, if you, if you want to see change or if you want to uh, hold the government to account, take your flag with you wherever you go. And so we started to crystallize off social media and onto the ground now. And people were bold enough to take their flags with them to work and to the shops and to take their kids you know, from school. And uh, you know, at that point, we realized, wait a minute, something is, something is happening here. I can't tell exactly which point it, it stopped just being a social media campaign and it became a movement. But I do know that at one point, we called the governor of the Reserve Bank and we wrote him a letter and we said, this is my, a friend of mine and I, and we said, sir, if you're so sure that the bond notes will work, we're challenging you to a citizen's debate uh, to come and explain yourself and to hear the citizens. And it was a joke when we wrote the letter. But he responded and said, come, let's do it. And we had the frankest discussion that probably has ever taken place with a public official in Zimbabwe. And citizens, young people, vendors, told him to his face that they did not trust him or the government because, in fact, one young man sat there and said to him, there was a picture of Robert Mugabe just behind 
uh, you know, the governor in, in, in the room we did uh, this debate. And he said to him, sir, with all due respect, you look like a nice guy, but we don't trust the fact that the picture, the man in the picture behind you, if he told you to print money, we don't trust that you would say no. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> And these are, these are young people beginning yeah. to realize, and there's nothing Western funded about that. Yeah. So mark my words, as this broadcast is happening right now, right now I will not be surprised if it shows up. So did you see him sitting with his funders? <laughs> <laughs> well, hello funders, by the way. <laughs> you get a chance to greet you. It's good to, it's good to meet the so-called funders. So, so it's this kind of thing that grew it, that caused it to grow as people began mm -hmm. to think more on the issues and think more about the fact that, no, wait a minute, uh, even if there is a if, even if there is an agenda, the fact is that there, there, is a, there, is a, there, there are questions that need to be answered. The president uh, called me a fake pastor. And I remember my response, and I said, granted that I may be a fake pastor. Granted that I may, I may actually be, be a charlatan. But there is nothing fake about the fact that we have a cash crisis that no one can explain in our country. There's nothing fake about the fact that we have $15 billion that the president himself said went missing from the coffers. And up to today, even though our government can go into a crowd of protesters and arrest people and charge them with cyber terrorism for using their phones, our government has failed to bring one person to account for a missing $15 billion. Do you know how much money that is? $15 billion. And you can arrest a guy that as a church of 50, no, wait a minute, I lied, 48 people. <laughs> you can arrest that guy and charge him, but you can't find a person amongst your own lieutenants that's responsible for that kind of money. So for us, that's, we began to see that we have a case with the issues. Let's press the buttons of the issues. And how did that feed into the shutdown Zimbabwe protest? I think it might be helpful for you just to explain to people what that was and why it was significant. The shutdown um, Zimbabwe um, event, which was on 6 July 2016, is something that will forever be etched in our memories as Zimbabweans for a long time. Because I think that's, that's the day that we began to grab back our power. And that's the day we began to show that, wait a second, we are the ones that are in control here. And what had happened, a lot of people, what had happened is this, is that, well, maybe let me put it this way, a lot of people credit me with, you know, with that shutdown, but it had nothing to do with me on my own. I was a contributing factor. Um, and this was, this was a spontaneous convergence of many issues. First and foremost, I remember what had happened was that the government had gone ahead and they had introduced a ban on the importation of basic commodities. And we have people that had made businesses out of importing basic commodities into Zimbabwe. And that's basically because we didn't have any access to jobs. The government promised us 2.2 million jobs. We've lost more jobs in Zimbabwe. Possibly, you know, in, in one era, we've lost more jobs possibly since independence. And so people created their own jobs by importing these basic commodities. But when the government introduced this law, people couldn't understand it. They're like, wait a minute, we don't have jobs, you're shutting that down for us. Apparently, you're, you're protecting local industries that don't exist. Mm. So the, the Friday uh, before that shutdown, there had been a protest at Bridge Border Post. And these were all the uh, cross-border traders. These were all the uh, people that lived off that industry. And they just had a protest that went crazy and went wild. And um, that kind of fueled, on the Monday, the uh, public transportation system also then went ahead and they were now complaining about the police uh, you know, uh, mishandling and, and how the police seems to be uh, taking money from them illegally and kind of accusing them of all sorts of little you know, uh, faults on their cars and take money from them. Uh, we then called the shutdown on that Monday, but the civil servants uh, called uh, a stay away from work for the Tuesday and the Wednesday. So it was a perfect storm kind of a moment. But what was amazing was that this was a point at which every Zimbabwean realized that if I don't stand with my fellow brothers and sisters, we will never have a voice that registers. And so that's how that came to be. And it is my hope going forward that 6 June every single year from now on, without government's permission in Zimbabwe, will always be a day that the citizens will stay at home.
Fantastic. Just to remind them who is in charge and who is in control. Amazing. <laughs> so you've talked a little bit about why people are so passionate about this flag and how it, how it brings people together. And I know that you've also spoken often about your commitment to nonviolence, constantly reiterating that in social media and in the media interviews that you do. Can you tell us why this is so important to the movement and why you chose to make it a main element? I think for, for me, there, I come from two departure points concerning the issue of nonviolence. The first one being that our government understands violence. This is a tool that they have used for years. They have perfected the art of being violent. And we've seen it over the years that anyone who has stood up against them, they've been violent. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, is, it became important for us to understand that we cannot go into, as we protest against the government, we cannot go into it trying to do what they do best. It became obvious that we would end up instilling more fear, or should I say if more people got hurt doing that, then it would destroy what we were trying to do. So that was number one. We can't do that because this is what they do best. And they, they, would, they love that opportunity. Like I said, as of, uh, as of this uh, earlier on this morning in Zimbabwe, unarmed citizens that were not fighting were beaten, including senior uh, citizens. Okay? And the second departure point is, for me, is more principle-based. My faith teaches me that violence begets violence. And this is the truth of the matter, is that whatever result we will achieve in Zimbabwe by the use of violence is going to have to be maintained by violence. Whatever we obtain by violence, we will have to maintain by violence. And that will give birth to a culture of violence, which we don't want going forward. But there is more power. I was talking yesterday. I had a chance to sit for about an hour and a bit with Ambassador Andrew Young in Atlanta. It was an outstanding meeting, and I said to him, tell me about the civil rights movement and how you use nonviolence. And he said to me, he said to me, there is more power in a silent protest than there is in a noisy one. And I found that profound because the Zimbabwe government has shown that they don't know what to do with people that are not being violent. Mm. They didn't know what to do with us when we stayed at home and we said we're not going to go to, go to work today. They almost went door to door to, in fact, they did, to knock people out of their homes and ask them, why didn't you go to work today? How ridiculous is that? i never forget, we, we, we had a protest that, that, that we did, and I was away from home. I was in South Africa at the time. Our cricket team, our lovely cricket team, the, the, the Zimbabwe cricket team, who many years ago began the idea of protesting with Henry Olonga and Andy Flower mm -hmm. when they mourned the death of democracy by putting on black armbands at a cricket game. And we remembered that they did that. And when New Zealand was playing Zimbabwe in Mulawai a couple of weeks ago, I just made a video and said, take your flags, go to the game. And in the 36 over, to show that we are done and dusted with 36 years of repression and being silent, lift up your flag and sing the national anthem. I wasn't even in the country. And thousands of Zimbabweans did it. It wasn't mm -hmm. violent. They didn't. How do you arrest people that are singing the national anthem holding <laughs> their flags? <laughs> It's, it was beautiful to see it. We didn't hit anybody. We didn't insult anybody. We just made a point. I loved seeing another uh, campaign that was started in Zimbabwe by a group of students. And what they did is they took their graduation gowns and their graduation caps, and they went onto the street, and they were selling sweets and chocolates like vendors. And they were playing football in the middle of the city square, putting on their gowns to show that we are unemployed, to show that our government has caused the very gowns of knowledge to be a sign of wasted talent. And the pictures went around the world. They spoke a thousand words. Those same students showed up at the cricket match putting on their gowns. And much to our surprise, the police arrested them for putting on graduations, graduation gowns at a cricket match. But, but for me, these are some of the means in which a government can be pressured and a government can and must be embarrassed. Yes, absolutely. Very, very strategic. <laughs> So I know following the shutdown, there was a massive clampdown on the movement, and that led to your arrest. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about the circumstances surrounding your arrest and the story by which you were released? Well, 
Um, it, it's still something that uh, was, uh, every time I think about it, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at what happened. Um, but we, we went in when the police had called that they wanted to question me. And um, so we went in voluntarily, and when we arrived there, they, um, after about an hour, two hours of interrogation, they then said, we're, we're going to charge you with inciting public violence. And that came as a shock for me, because first and sure. foremost, I've never been arrested in my entire life. I'd never been charged for anything. And um, the second thing that shocked me about the fact you know, about their charge was that I was not, I did not incite any violence at all. In all the videos I had made, at one point what, what I had done is that I'd say to Zimbabweans, you carry your flag with you every day uh, for 25 days from the 1st of May to the 25th of May. My commitment is I will make a video for every one of those days. I'll make a three minute video telling you why and encouraging you why you should carry your flag with mm. you. And uh, so, they, so I sent up those videos, and in each of those videos, literally as a matter of, of, of principle, I would say don't be violent, don't incite, and don't insult anybody. Don't insult the president, don't insult anyone. Just carry your flag with you. Even when we did the shutdown, I said to people, stay at home. Don't go out, don't fight, don't throw stones. Just, do, just stay at home and do nothing. And to be charged with that was a, was a surprise. But the expectation was that I would be out in 48 hours, which is the law. You know, they're allowed to hold you, detain you for 48 hours. You must appear before a magistrate then uh, within that space of time. And I expected that they would, you know, release me on bail. Um, before the, the day was over, they handcuffed me, took me, and said, we're going to take you to your house to search your house because we're looking for, uh, like uh, Doc was saying, we're looking for a button stick, uh, you know, and, uh, and a police helmet. And I said, I, I, what would I be doing with a police helmet? Um, you know, but they said, no, we believe you stole these things. And really what they wanted to do was to uh, search my house and get my phone. But uh, anyway, we, 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 we took off going to my house, and they put these handcuffs on me, which was quite a surreal moment. Mm -hmm. I think that's when it clicked when they put the handcuffs on, that, wait a minute, I'm actually arrested here. We got to a house, and my wife came out, and I said to her, please make sure the girls are not here, my five-year-old and three-year-old. I said, I don't, want them to, I don't want them to see me like this, um, you know. And so, you know, we went through all of that. They found nothing. And then, of course, they locked me up. And um, the next morning, I was supposed to appear before the magistrate. And uh, we delayed going because they said that there was a handful of people at the, at the courts that had their flags on, and they were concerned that there may be some violence. So we delayed and eventually got there, and there was a huge crowd that was there. I distinctly remember as I sat in one of the cells that they have at the magistrate's court, it's, a, it's, it's, it's just naturally a filthy place, and uh, you know, there's urine just, just done rampantly or, or you know, uh, randomly, and uh, just sat in there with other prisoners that were there. And I want to say this, that I met some young men in the cell where I was that told me some, some real genuine stories. And each of them knew who I was. And they said, they, they went around and began to explain what they were in for. The one guy said he had stolen a two liter bottle of juice. And the other young man said that he had you know, smoked some, uh, you know, some, some, some weed of some sort. And another young guy said he had stolen a supermarket trolley because he wanted to use it to help people carry their groceries from the supermarket to the, uh, you know, to the public transport and charge some money for it. And, and they were arrested for this. And there was about 22 of these young guys. And they all looked at me and they said, you don't look like the kind of guy that should be in here. In fact, people like you, when they come, who put on glasses like you, it's fraud. It's usually fraud. <laughs> and they said, so how much money did you take? <laughs> but anyway, we, we spoke through it. And when we were done, and I'd been telling them about the fact that I'm just a citizen who stood up and who's standing up for my family and standing up for our nation. The one young guy looked at me and he says, you know, Pastor, we, we want you to know that we don't do what we do because we want to. We're not proud of the fact that we steal from people. We're not proud of the fact that we do these things. But we have nothing else to do in terms of looking after our family. And then he finished off by saying this. He says, for me, getting arrested is a blot on my character. But for you, getting arrested is a, is a badge on your shoulder. And it broke my heart. Mm. And he said to me, 
words that I only have ever read in the Bible. I mean, it was the most amazing sentence. He said to me, remember me when you get out. And so it, so it was as much as I was incarcerated, I got a chance to see people that don't have thousands stand for them like thousands stood for me. Mm. And so anyway, the, the case uh, went on. We, we were delayed. Eventually, I was brought before the magistrate late into the day. I was supposed to have appeared by about 9 in the morning, ended up appearing at about 6 p.m. Uh, in front of the magistrate. And my lawyer came up to me, and he said to me, um, Pastor, I, I've got some bad news for you. And for me, bad news meant I was going to spend another night. So I, I said, well, oh, okay, what, they're going to throw me back in? He says, no, the charge has been changed. And I said, well, what could it be? And he said, they're now charging you with uh, subverting a constitutionally elected government. I looked at him, I said, now, and, and in English, what does that mean? <laughs> and he says, well, it means 14 to 20 years behind bars. It's almost as good as treason. My heart, I... My heart exploded. I remember my wife, I saw her in the corner of my eyes. She was sitting in the, in, the, in the crowd. And I thought to myself, what have I done? What have I done? But what, how that unfolded, and I know I take a bit of time, but it, it was such a moment of power for the citizens of Zimbabwe. As the magistrate began, he would take recesses. And every time he would take a recess, I would be asked to leave the courthouse. And the people that came in, and by the way, I found out that I had about 100 lawyers that came to represent me. I only knew of one. And there were, there were 100, and I thought, my gosh, what is going on? When the magistrate asked who's representing this man, all of them produced their certificates. And I was so amazed at these young men and young women who came to fight for justice, who came to make a statement. And so I would, they would shift me out each time he would, he would go for a break. And, and the second break, which was much longer than the other breaks, the courthouse broke into song. It was an unprecedented move. I thought there were people outside until one of the prison guards came to tell me. And he says to me, do you realize that you have caused people to sing in the courthouse and the magistrate could shut this whole thing down and adjourn this thing and cause you to be tried on another day? That means you're going to be shut up for a couple more days. I thought to myself, I wish they would stop singing, but it got louder. <laughs> and they, they sang worship songs. And there's a point I was sitting on, on, on the floor, on the concrete floor in this waiting cell. And I was crying, and I thought to myself, Lord, why, why, why? i never forget, I asked three times, I said, Lord, why, why, why? And immediately they began to sing a song that most Zimbabweans know. Mazimba kambuwa mshika zianga jimbe. And it says, and Zimbabwe shall... Be saved, and Zimbabwe shall be saved. The Holy Spirit must come down, and Zimbabwe shall be saved. At that point, I, I, I cried even louder, but I knew exactly what was going on. I knew that those people were determined, and that they had found an opportunity and that they were going to take that opportunity to annoy this government to the max. <laughs> they sang. I mean, they did all sorts of things. Eventually, we, you know, the story, obviously, as, as you know, when the magistrate came back, and we don't know where he was for an hour and a half, um, but he came back and was left with no choice but to, to release me. And um, on leaving the courthouse, one of the prison guards whispered in my ear and said, you have to take a different route out of here because you are going to be rearrested the moment you walk out. And it's a story I haven't told, but as we walked out of the jail, which is just you know, kind of like a, a, on a, on a, in a basement, this young man walked behind me and he said to me, as we walk, take the first right. Don't go straight through to the main gate as you were told at checkout. Believe it or not, they have checkout, a checkout desk. And so he said, he said you, you make a right turn instead. There's some people waiting. Now, I didn't know who he was and what he was talking about. But I got to this gate, and right out of the corner of my eye to the right, I saw four of the lawyers that had been inside. I've never run so fast towards a lawyer like I did on that day. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was, again, these are people I didn't know from a bar of soap, but they felt like, they felt like friends, like comrades. And so, of course, we left, and the shock of seeing the crowds of people outside the shock of understanding what had taken place, that people had been waiting for hours and that they had made sandwiches for each other 
and then went and bought candles for each other. And people had spent the day kneeling in front of the riot police and praying and singing and encouraging each other. It was outstanding, outstanding. And so the highlight of that day for me was the fact that the citizens of Zimbabwe showed up to be able to reclaim their country again. And at that very point, that's when something turned and something really special began to happen in Zim. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing the very intimate details of, <laughs> of that time. So I know that uh, you have said that this is a, a great movement that has the capacity to bring about real change. But there have been many naysayers who have said that we've seen many times like this before where there's been hope and it's been dashed and that this thing is going to fizzle out. How do you respond to that kind of criticism? What capacity do you really think the movement has to bring about real change in Zimbabwe? I think the, the one thing that people have to understand about this movement and the many other movements, and please understand that it's not just this flag. There are many other expressions uh, you know, of the citizens' you know, movements in Zimbabwe. The one thing that we, the citizens, know is that we are not waiting for a victory. We're not waiting for a change. We already have it. We already have the change because we've created space for citizens that was, that was not previously there. We have been able to cause our government to so panic that they have gone and created laws, crafted laws, to try and catch one or two people, to try and extradite somebody for posting something on Facebook. So, so we know that we already have a victory. And when we started out, the idea was that we want to make sure that as many Zimbabweans that have been absent from ra raising their voices are now present, that many more Zimbabweans now stand up, that we have unity. So those two things were our initial objectives. Number one, the unity of Zimbabweans. We have achieved that. There is no question about that. Number two, the raising of voices by citizens. We've achieved that. So I, I really want to, to, to just say that we've already achieved our victory. If we were crushed today completely, if this thing died down today already, something has happened in Zimbabwe that people have seen that they can't unsee. We've seen it and we now know, and the government now knows that we now know, that they now know that we now know. <laughs> And I think for me, that's the special thing that has taken place. So going forward, everything we are now getting, everything we are now striving for is a result of these victories that we have already gotten. And depending on what happens between now and, and the elections in 2018, anything that's happening right now between now and 2018 is change. It already is change. The fact that the citizens are prepared now to have a protest almost every day of the week is an amazing feat. And this is where we are going. We say to the citizens that if it means that we keep our government busy with a different protest in a different place every single day, so be it. So be it. So the change has already happened in that citizens are now the game-changing factor mm. in Zimbabwe. And both the ruling party and opposition uh, politicians know that, mm. that we now are awake. We are ready, yes, to vote, but we are also ready to protect mm. our vote. So talking about game changes, I know that the Rural Teachers Association has just begun a 10-day march to cover 200 kilometers from the rural areas to Harare. And they've also been um, encouraged by the groups, other groups on the ground that are working with you, Tajamuka and Occupy Africa Unity Square. What role do you think those groups are going to pay, play in taking the movement forward? These groups are, are playing amazing roles. I, I take my hat off. The teachers in Zimbabwe are amongst the most uncelebrated heroes that we have in our nation. Please, and I'll ask for a round of applause. Please. And I, I say so because every Zimbabwean who has left Zimbabwe to come and be in places like Washington, D.C., to be anywhere in the world, came through the hands of a teacher who is overworked and underpaid, and especially the rural teachers. And I know this because a part of my education actually happened in a rural area where I went to school where teachers had the resources that were deplorable, but they produced stars. 
They produce people that are running global corporations today. And many of these teachers are stuck right back in the same rural areas mm -hmm. with nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. So for them to be able to say, listen, let's begin to stand up. Let's begin to make our voice register is a huge move. One of the questions a lot of people have been asking is what do we do to make sure that people in the rural areas are aware of the fact that citizens are beginning to rise. Those teachers are part of that infrastructure. They're part of the people that when their students see them and they say, why are you going to do this work? They will tell them that, no, we're doing it because we haven't been paid and that we're not being treated right. We're doing it because certain things are not right in our country. So they, they, they are an indicator that the message has penetrated the rural areas. Even though some of the propaganda may be that, well, these protests are only being done by people in urban areas, the government knows that they've been caught. They know it. And people in the rural areas understand. So this, these are so important because they're helping to permeate every aspect of the Zimbabwean you know, culture and life and society, unreachable areas or, 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 or people groups that were apathetic. Everyone is finding a way to get involved through you know, something that speaks to them. And that's what's important about the rural teachers and anyone else that's starting a movement. We have to have more and more movements come up. In fact, I said this to somebody. I said, we have to have as many movements in Zimbabwe as there are issues on the ground. Mm -hmm. We have to, I'm waiting for a movement to come up that says no more foreign trips for the president. <laughs> and all they do is just hack on about that. Mm. Because it is immoral for our leader to travel and spend money going for a checkup, enough money to build a small clinic and stock up that clinic with medicines for a whole month. And so for me, those are the issues. And we, we continue to say to the citizens, stick to the issues. Find a way to express your displeasure at the issues. Start a campaign. Start a protest. Do it. There'll be people standing with you. Mm -hmm. But it's important that everyone uh, gets a chance to put their hands on deck. Fantastic. And just uh, in closing now, before we move to questions on the floor, when you mentioned uh, that you were going to be coming to the US for this trip, I know there was a lot of mixed responses in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, some worrying that the movement wouldn't be able to continue without you, um, all sorts of different things that people had to say. So what is your response to that? Do you think that the movement can continue in your absence? And what is your plan for while you're here? The movement is, 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 is not going, it's not, it's not, we're not talking about that, it's, is it going to continue in my absence? It is continuing in my absence. And it must continue in my absence, in fact, the movement must stop depending on me. Because this is something that's owned by everyone, by every Zimbabwean. The day, you see, the day that they laughed and they said it's a fad is the day that people began to buy shares <laughs> in the movement. That's the day people began to say, this is mine. I'm going to be a part of this. So it's definitely carrying on even without me being physically on mm -hmm. the ground. Remember, we started this online as well. And so our generation understands that distance and geolocations are not things that concern us because our reality is, is not about the fact that the person who started it is here. We can still communicate. We can still exchange ideas. We can still you know, uh, you know, make things happen. So for me, the excitement is that there are people that who are even more passionate than I am that have taken up the cause. And I'm happy that many of those people are even going to greater extents than me in terms of expressing their displeasure at what government has done or expressing you know, their, their, their feeling and thought about how they want to see Zimbabwe built uh, you know, going forward. So it's, it's bigger than myself. It's bigger than me. I think that already we're looking in, uh, in, in September, there's a group of Zimbabweans that are going to be hosting, and I'm part of those Zimbabweans now, in September at the United Nations General Assembly. We are going to have the biggest protest, out the biggest one that has ever happened outside Zimbabwe here. And my hope is that we can gather two, three, five thousand Zimbabweans in New York City to come and protest. And before Robert Mugabe either dies, resigns, or loses an election, he needs to know that the citizens everywhere stood up.
thank you so much. Uh, we've really appreciated you taking part in this conversation thank with you. us. And now we're going to make it a broader conversation and open it up to the floor for questions. So just a couple of things before we get started. There's a lot of people here today, and we have very limited time. Uh, so we will have some people bring around microphones. I ask that you make your question very specific and very short. Please don't use this as an opportunity to make a statement, but ask a question. Um, and if you go over time, I'm probably going to have to ask you to, to, uh, to cut you off and move on. So let's just keep it short and to the point so we can get as many questions in as possible. So we have the two mics. Uh, we're going to take questions three at a time and then uh, give Ivan a moment to respond. So let's start here with the gentleman in the suit here and then move to the left here. And then um, we'll take a third question uh, from the lady with the glasses on her head there. Uh, if you could just identify yourself and your affiliation um, before you start. Thank you. Uh, Doug Brooks. And uh, my affiliation is I was a teacher at Kambazuma High School number one wow. years ago. And <laughs> it, it's very inspiring, uh, th this whole talk. Uh, my question, you mentioned a little bit about talk about the guard helping you out in the, uh, in the court. What sort of support have you received from within the security services? It seems to me that this is their country too, and, and it seems to me they might be interested in supporting this movement as well instead of opposing it. Thank you. So we'll move, we'll do this. Move to the next. Thank question. you. Hello, Pastor Ivan. Hello. A very good friend of mine it's from good Zimbabwe. To see you, yeah. Good to see you too. My, God, uh, my name is <laughs> <laughs> My name is Nyara Zomesha Mombe. I know Ivan from. I mean, uh, we went to the same church pr before he started his uh, church, but we've also worked together in Zimbabwe. I work in the movement, uh, in the civic society movement. I work, I run a nonprofit for girls and young women. And I've been for a bit of time in the movement. My concern, Pastor Ivan, has been that um, I am concerned about the issues of, the civic society has been working on the same issues for a long time. Um, and the civic society has been working with the citizens and entered the, the new era of this flag. Fantastic. My translation of this flag is that it's reaching to the people, especially in the church, who were not empowered because the issue of protest have been happening uh, prior okay, let's, to... Let's move to the question. Right. So my question is, what is it that you are doing? I've reached out before in your inbox on Facebook. What is it that you're doing to make sure that you are working together with the civic society where a lot of money has gone also in terms of uh, creating the space for governance accountability that we're talking about? And also, what is it that citizens can do to reach to you? Because I've also tried to reach out and probably you're overwhelmed. So my question is that the issue of working together and realizing that there's a lot of work that's been happening on the ground, but also well done on the work that you've been doing, especially in, 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 in modeling this to the church, because for me, the church had been not taking part as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And our final question. Um, the lady here in the, with the glasses on her head and the white top. So we will take another round after this. We're just going to do them in batches of three. Thank you. My name is Alice Thomas, and I work at, the, uh, at Refugees International on the Climate Change Program. Pastor Evan, thank you for your comments. It was really an honor to be here today. Uh, I just came back from Zimbabwe in June where we were looking at the impacts of the drought, and I'm wondering if you think the two years of drought in Zimbabwe has contributed in any way to what's happening now. Thank you. So just to sum those up for you, um, what is the support that you have seen or haven't seen from the security sector? Uh, what are you doing to work with civil society and uh, increase citizen engagement? And what is the impact of the drought? And has that uh, facilitated the events that have happened? OK, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to you know, answer as best as I can. And, and, um, uh, you know, I, and I, I was saying uh, to Chloe earlier on, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is that I'm not, a, I'm not a politician and I'm not a you know, um, an accomplished activist, um, you know, for me, words like democratization are, are new words. You know, I'm used to salvation. Uh, <laughs> those are kind of my, my words. So I'm, I'll answer as best as I can. And, you know, if, if I get it wrong, uh, you, know, you know, feel free to start a hashtag, uh, you, you know, about that, you know, as well. So talking about the security sector, thank you for, for, for that question because 
being in my position has allowed me to see um, some of the people that work within the security sector face to face and to spend some time with them and to hear some of their thoughts about what's going on in our country. And I think the thing that citizens would find uh, surprising is that these people are hurting as well. And one of the things that uh, I found was uh, a gentleman who would inform me of certain things that were about, uh, about to happen. Uh, for example, um, one of them told us that if I went and spent the night at home the day that I was leaving the court, I would either be arrested or abducted on that very night. And so he basically just got that message straight through to us via some of our pastors that had come. And these are pastors that I didn't know that, we, that, that just mobilized and came to the courthouse. And one of them came up to uh, one of the, the, uh, the people that were close to me and said, listen, I have this information that if he goes home tonight, he'll be arrested or, or he'll be abducted. And that was a sign for me that there are people that, that are in there that, that are wanting to help the cause. Because the reality of the situation is that the cash crisis in Zimbabwe is not selective. You know, if I, if I can't get money from the bank, then you also can't get money from the bank. If my kids can't go to, same thing. It's, it's, it, these people understand their children, their, their wives also have to go to the same hospitals as our wives go. And you go to another hospital and there's no water at Harada Hospital. And yet it only costs $1,800 to sink a borehole at Harada Hospital. And it costs anything between 48000 and 67000 to build a swimming pool at the house, which every government minister in Zimbabwe has a swimming pool at the house, and none of them can swim anyway. <laughs> and, 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 and these people see it. No, no, I'm trying to paint a picture for you. These guys that are in the security services, they see it. They drive these people in expensive cars. They go and they guard their homes. And then he has to go back to a shack. They have to guard this man or this woman as they eat an expensive meal. A meal that in one, one, one meal is more than his salary. He has to watch them do that. So it's a reality for him. He can see it happening. But the one thing, again, that maybe our citizenry doesn't understand about our security forces is that the fear that governs them is possibly greater than the one that has held us back. These people are ruled by fear. These people are brought in line by fear. It is a scary thing for someone who is uh, in the police or who is in intelligence or who is in the army to actually speak up. And so one of the things that we continue to openly encourage our brothers and sisters that are in the security sector is to help us, help us with information. Do what you can. Leak information to us. Inform us. Let us know what's going on. Let us know what's about to happen. And what I love again about the citizens' movement is that because we don't have a, a, a central committee, because we don't have a politburo, you know, we, 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 we don't have meetings where we gather to discuss strategy in secret. Our strategy is discussed right in the open. We discuss our strategy on social media. We discuss our strategy on WhatsApp. And it is, it is in, for the government, they don't get it. In their minds, they think there is a secret movement. There is a gathering somewhere. That's, but we're doing it right there. So they know what we're about to do when we're about to do it. And the cool thing is that with everything that we're about to do, they are powerless to stop it. It's just, it's going to happen. It's that simple. We're not, we're not, we're not trying to, we're not trying to do anything that's illegal. So these people are there and, and, and uh, they, there is some form of reaching out to them, which is very simple because they watch our videos. When they watch our videos for intelligence, we hope that at some point something cuts to their conscience. And they, and they say, wait, wait a minute, this man or this woman is talking about what I'm going through, or, you know, about what I'm facing. So that reaching out is starting to happen, and it's, it's exciting to see them feed back information to us and let us know, uh, you know, you know, what's going on inside. Uh, and then uh, the question from Nyari. Nyari, it's really good to see you. She, you were, I know that you've worked very hard in Zimbabwe over the years and continue to do. I envy you for being able to go back home when you want. Uh, you know, so that you can, you can, you can continue the work. Um, civic society in Zimbabwe is something that citizens have been unaware of for a very long time. And I want to, I want to say this from an honest perspective. The, in the mind of, of many Zimbabweans, not all of us, 
when we think about, and we do, by the way, as citizens, we don't call you civic society. That's the name that we, we now know you're called by. In, 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 in the Zimbabweans, we know you as NGOs. Doesn't matter what you do, we just call it NGO, or we just say, nah, imari zima donates. <laughs> yeah, these are donor fans. That's, that's all we know, right? And many of us, in our minds, we, our interpretation of NGOs or, or CSOs is that you are there to bring relief. So it's about relief work. It's about distributing food, you know, in the rural areas and, and things like that. But we, we didn't have an understanding of the work that you do to say, for example, you know, support citizens' movements or the work that you do. For example, many of us started finding out about Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights when we got arrested. And yet they've been around, you know, for a long time. We didn't know about Zim rights. We didn't know about, you know, the different groups that are there. So I think this has now created an opportunity where civic society can then say to the citizens, guess what? What you guys are doing out of passion, we do as a profession. We have, you know, strategy. We have... We are moved by passion. You are moved by passion. I'd, I'd like to think most of you are moved by passion. Because I think, and I, th and I hope you can allow me to be honest, because I think part of it as well for citizens, part of the feeling has been that sometimes civic society does it because it's a job, it's eight to five, and, you know, in terms of speaking out and so forth. But I'm glad to know that it's, you know, it's also by passion. But I think this is now the opportunity where civic society can come out and say, hey, by the way, these things, we've been studying them, or we have certain studies that can help in this area or can help uh, in that area. So this is a great time for that marriage to take place, for the citizenry that the civic society has been trying so hard over the years to reach and to educate. This is a great time now for that to happen. So for example, we are not funded as uh, you know, citizens' movement. And I think it's a great idea for us not to be funded because it helps us to keep our eyes on the issues. We remain about the issues. And it will be great to now get together with organizations that teach things like, say, uh, you know, voter education, that teach things like the knowledge or understanding of the Constitution or how the law works. You know, I was taught for the first time through Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, uh, when you get arrested, what do you do? You know, how do you behave? Uh, you know, those kinds, and I, did, I used to take that for granted. It was amazing to get a book that I could read real quick, uh, you, know, you know, as part of that. So it's a great opportunity for citizens to take advantage of the work that civic society has already done, but also a great advantage for civic society to look at the citizens and say, what have these people done that we haven't done over the last, you know, couple of years of building for them? And take that and begin to also, uh, you know, use it in, uh, you know, in, in maybe trainings or things like that. So. That's my, my, my kind of take on it. I think I had one more on, yeah, so the on that. About the, the question the about the impact of the drought. I think definitely the drought has had an effect in Zimbabwe. But what has had a bigger and more profound effect during this time in terms of uh, the contribution of the drought as a, uh, as a flashpoint for citizens is government's unpreparedness for a drought. And so, you know, whilst you can't really control a drought, you can, we've learned that you can be better prepared for it. And when we start to understand that our government has had aid given to it, has had money given to it, but they failed to be ready for times like these. They failed to be ready for us, the citizens, when, you know, when there is a drought. That is where more of the flashpoint is. That is more where our, 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 our dissatisfaction is that you have not been ready when the drought you know, has, has come through. And so I think, again, that's that for us, that, you know, that, is, the, you know, that, that is where the, uh, the button is. Great. Thank you so much. OK, we're going to take another round. Uh, when you're called on, the microphone will come to you. Um, so we're going to start here in the front with the gentleman in the blue shirt, and then move to the very back, the gentleman there in the suit, and then move here to behind our cameraman here is a lady with a flag around her neck, um, and she'll be our third. So once you have the microphone, please go ahead. Don't forget to introduce yourself. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm Todd Moss with the Center for Global Development. And while we're uh, celebrating Zimbabwean teachers, I think every day of uh, my teacher, my Shona teacher, Omai Nagato at uh, Ranch House College. So uh, thankful wow. for her. Um, you, you, you called for citizens to stand up on specific issues. You mentioned the foreign travel. I think um, the uh, no to bond, uh, to bond notes is a very important uh, campaign to try to deny 
uh, the government from stealing from Zimbabwe's future. Uh, but you're in Washington, D.C., just a few blocks away is the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And I'm wondering, to what extent are Zimbabwean citizens aware that there is a campaign largely pushed by certain European shareholders to clear Zimbabwe's arrears at the IMF World Bank and African Development Bank to enable new lending to the government. And less than a month ago, there was a report uh, by the African Development Bank to its shareholders, which declared there were no longer any human rights problems in Zimbabwe. So are, is this an issue? Arrears clearance is very wonky and policy. It's not a street issue. But if that happens, the, the, the floodgates will be open for hundreds of millions of dollars in new lending to the government. Is that something that the Zimbabwean citizenry uh, is motivated on? Thank you. OK, our next question, I think, was at the very back there, the gentleman in the suit. Uh, my name is Dan Moyo. I'm a political activist. And I want to say welcome, Pastor Mawarire, Thank you, to the land of the free and the home of the brave. Um, my question is, uh, when everything is said and done, uh, the problem we all know is that there's, there's a need for a change of government. We can protest all we want, uh, but if that government remains in place, nothing is going to change, in my opinion. So therefore, uh, my question is, we are already less than 24 months into the next election, and we know that uh, ZANU-PF will start campaigning and will start scheming how to rig the next election. Uh, what are we doing now that we are united as Zimbabweans to come up with a plan to make sure that uh, the next elections in Zimbabwe are free and fair and that they are credible? Thank you. How are you, uh, Pastor Ivan? Hi, ma'am. Uh, my name is Chuane, so I drove last night. I'm from Philadelphia just to come for this. Oh, wow. Well um, <laughs> When I see you, I don't see a politician. I see Zimbabwe's Desmond Tutu. What are you going to do? Are you going to try and reach out to Desmond Tutu to mentor you? Are you going to try to reach out to Al Sharpton, Jackie Jackson, and help you on those issues? Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So feel free to tackle those questions in any order uh, you would like. And if you want any more clarity on the IMF question, we can okay. help with that too. It's, it's, it's a real interesting to note that we're across the road from the IMF and, and uh, World Bank. For many Zimbabweans, these are institutions that exist somewhere in some world somewhere. So, you know, I might go there just to have a word with somebody. Anyway, um, <laughs> but I, I think the, it, it, is, it is a shame that anybody would say that there is no record of human rights violations in Zimbabwe. The whole world can see it's a lie. The entire world can see that's a lie. We don't even have to go far. I could show you images on my phone from this morning from today, from this morning, where people are being beaten up by a police force. And so for, for us, the citizens, to be, to be treated as if we are, we are pawns on a chessboard is, is something that, that, you know, that we have decided, listen, we, you know, we're done with this. And I think something I said when I started off, I said I know that Zimbabwe is reported upon here through research and reports and statistics. But it's, it's time for Zimbabwe to be reported upon by our tears, by our, the real stories of people that are being tortured, people that are being murdered. Itai Zamara was, 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 was abducted, and no one knows where he is for holding up a placard in a public space, exercising his constitutional right. Uh, we, people have been arrested and, 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 and beaten. I'm sure you might have seen the videos that went around a couple of months ago 
of women that were placed uh, under arrest because they were accused of taking part in demonstrations. And whilst they were sitting, defenseless women, they were being beaten by police. One police officer actually took the baby from this woman so that she could be more comfortable as she got beaten. And, 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 and a bank goes ahead to release a report that says we're free of uh, human rights violations. And there needs to, there is a, you know, Africa needs to have a conversation with itself that is critical. And for me, this is where the critical conversation must happen in Africa. Those that are liberators of our continent have to now get to a place where they can look each other in the eye and say, what you are doing to your people is not right. Until they do that, the leaders in our continent are letting our generation down. And when I went into South Africa, uh, the ANC Secretary General was asked what he thought of this young man that had crossed into South Africa. And he said that he's a dissident and he's Western funded and Western founded. And I thought to myself, you know, this is a violation of everything Ubuntu. Now, Ubuntu is a concept in Africa that I know many people know. You, I am because of you. We are because of, because of each other. And one of the things that we have in Shona culture and in Debele culture as well, in fact, in many of the cultures in Zimbabwe and Africa, is that my father's brother is my father. My father's older brother is my father. And when I have a problem with my father, I go to my father's brother. And I, I tell him what has happened. And he mediates on my behalf. He goes to my dad and says to him, I see this is your son has come to my house. He's crying about what's going on. You can't do that to your boy. In fact, you know what? I'll keep him at my house until you cool down, and then I'll send him back after you give me a guarantee that he's going to be safe. But, in our, but now these guys that are liberators don't do that. They don't hold each other truly to account. And what must happen is that when reports are done, whatever the motivation is to tell a lie, there must be people that are peer liberators or peer politicians in, in, in Africa that rise up to say, no, but this is not right. But no, you, we can't condone this anymore. We can't stand aside you know, and watch. So it's, I think for us, it, is, it would be tragic. And for the, for the IMF and the World Bank to accept that kind of a report as truth, for us is, it further, it further reinforces the fact that we are truly on our own. And it further puts a dent, not into, only into our hopes for a better Zimbabwe, but into the hopes of every other nation around the world. And so our hope is that they may start to really see the story for what it is on the ground and treat this government the way it needs to be treated. They come to us and they say to us, you are Western funded for questioning them. And yet they're the first ones to come to the very West and ask for money. As, a, as an ordinary citizen, it's, it confuses me. It confuses me. So, so I think there's a, there's a point. I hope I've answered this correctly. But my, I think my, my point here is that the IMF and the World Bank can no longer turn a blind eye. They lose credibility each time they do that. You know, and they lose our support as Zimbabwean citizens anyway each time they do that. This government can no longer have people hide. This is not the age for people to allow more and more lives to, to be lost. We are longing for people that have got a different view, that can stand up and say, this is unjust, it's not right, it won't be tolerated, and we're not going to, uh, we're not going to be hoodwinked into, you know, towing the line uh, that way. I hope I've answered that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that way. Okay. Um, I think the other one was, what are we doing about the uh, uh, Mkoma at the back? Uh, wonderful question, and thank you so much, Mkoma Mandi, Mandi Chingamidza. It's good to see you. Um, so we're asking about uh, what will happen to make the next elections free and fair, okay. and what hope there is of a change of government. The, the one thing that we have found, Mkoma, is that the rigging machinery in Zimbabwe is is difficult for any citizen to go and physically dismantle. I mean, like you've said, we've had elections done over the years. We've had uh, monitors come in over the years. There is one thing that we have found, at least that I know we have found. We have found each other. And the one thing that we know is that if we mobilize enough people and enough Zimbabweans to be prepared to vote in the coming elections, then the change that we want is going to be undeniable. One of the things I'm pushing forward for Zimbabweans as we go towards the elections 
is for us to have an overwhelming participation in the elections, something that is undeniable, because that's the only tool that we have, the numbers. If we can overwhelm the system with sheer numbers, so what this means is that going forward, we should now start, and I know that many other movements have started, we should now start to talk about voter registration to make sure everybody goes to register to vote. We should now start talking about why it's important for you to protect the vote, why it's important for you to make sure that your, your, your neighbor votes. But, then we, but that's nothing without the opposition politics, because I think our understanding now as citizens is that whatever change we're going to have in Zimbabwe is going to be through a political vehicle. So our, we are now looking at the opposition politics, and we're saying, guys, wake up. We are united. We need you to take advantage of our unity. You be united so that we no longer present this fragmented front. Can we just have one front that is united? Everybody will get behind it. It will be overwhelming. And this day is, AC, mark my words. Mark my words. You, you are going to see something happen in Zimbabwe that Robert Mugabe and his government never, ever thought they would see. An overwhelming turnout of people coming to silently make their decision. And the thing is, they're expecting a fight. It will be done so simply and so swiftly as Zimbabweans unite. So those two things for me, number one, encouraging our opposition to become, number one, united, and number two, to become inspiring people that can capture the imagination of the citizens. And I know that that discussion is happening. And number two, to just mobilize, 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 and mobilize. People are asking me the question, well, so we've spoken up, what next? What next that we speak some more? We don't have yet enough people. We have to have more and more and more and more and more people getting on to a movement, getting a chance to express their voice. Because what we're doing is we're activating voters. We're activating uh, 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 agents of change. And so we can't stop. Those that have been doing it for longer are going to have to do it for even longer because we still have people that are not yet on board. And when 2018 comes, by a miracle of God in terms of something very different happening, when 2018 comes, this is going to be the most exciting election that any Zimbabwean has ever taken part in. So we'll just finish up with that last question there about um, whether you draw inspiration uh, from Desmond Tutu and whether you're going to reach out for some support from other heroes like that. You know, you, when you, you, and I'm so glad you talked about Desmond Tutu. Uh, that, is such, that is a towering figure when it comes to democracy and social justice. And I definitely draw inspiration uh, from, from him. Whilst I was in South Africa, we went to Cape Town, and I got a chance to reach out to the man who is now the bishop uh, at the church where Desmond Tutu uh, you know, was, uh, was the bishop. And um, though I didn't get a chance to meet him, uh, we've had some exchanges. And most definitely, I'm reaching out to as many uh, men and women that have been icons of freedom and justice across the world as I can. As I said earlier on, I met, uh, I met uh, Ambassador Andrew Young uh, yesterday, who gave me some amazing, amazing insights into Zimbabwe, which he loves very much. He knows a lot about Zimbabwe. He was involved in the negotiations in the 70s, 1977 to 1980, uh, in terms of Zimbabwe, uh, you know, becoming what it is today. And so definitely I'm reaching out as much as I can uh, to be able to learn lessons and draw inspiration. But I think it's something that every Zimbabwean has got to do is to even reach back into our own liberation heroes. There are so many men and women that over the years, some of us thought that they were frauds, like some of the men and women that lead our country today. And yet we're finding out that those are the true heroes. The late, uh, you know, Josiah Tongogara, the Chitepos, uh, you know, so many of, so many of these, Jason Zia, Papa Moyo, uh, you know, so many of these men and women that laid their lives down, the ideals they had, the Edson Zobos, we these are inspirations for Zimbabwe. Uh, and Zimbabweans have got to understand, again, that as much as we have external heroes and people that we can look to, a lot of the heroism we're looking for is locked up in you and me. 
it's, it's me, I'm the one. It's amazing to find out that the only people that have been able to bring the kind of change that we've been looking for are the citizens uh, you know, of Zimbabwe. So definitely we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe, for ably and uh, adroitly moderating the session. And thank you, Pastor Vaughn. Thank for you. Doc, can you just allow me, please? Mommy, please, please let me hear your question. Thank you for having my I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mom. I'm sorry, Doc. Please, please forgive me. I, she, she started a long time ago, and I must hear. Thank you, I'm grateful you're so amazing. <laughs> okay. Um, Monica Mzizewa, I'm a pastor just like you. Amen. My question is, the Zimbabwean Constitution gives sweeping powers to the defense forces not only to be confined to barracks, but to actively be involved in everything else, like uh, internally and externally. So concerning security matters, so how are you gonna work that out? You think you'll be safe or? Thank you, thank, thank you again for that, for that question. You know when, when citizen number one mentions your name and says that people like me don't belong to Zimbabwe, and then he does it another speech and says people like him should be dealt with, you, you, are ne you know that safety is not going to be guaranteed. But there's something I learned the day that I came out of court, which is a lesson that will stick with me for a long time and a lesson that I'm trying my best to teach our citizens as much as we can that our security when we rise up against the government, when we rise up as individuals or a group, our security is within the citizenry. It is you and I that look after each other. And one of the reasons why I was not rearrested on that fateful June the 13th evening is that I was released straight into a crowd of about 4,000 people. You can't take me from 4,000 people. But this is the thing is that now we have to develop a culture that says an injustice to one is an injustice to all. We have to start taking personally. Linda Masarira right now is still uh, in prison in Zimbabwe for something that she did not do. And it is the strength of the citizens that keep showing up to her hearings. They keep going to stand for her. They keep making a noise about her. So we are each other security. And if we ever let someone stand alone again, like we did with Itai Zamara, we will never see the kind of change that we want to see. Thank you very much. We thank all of you for for joining us today, both those here in the room and those who are joining us through our uh, live webcasts. Uh, please continue to follow the, uh, this particular conversation at hashtag ACZIM, as well as our uh, upcoming events at AC Africa Center. And finally, please join me in thanking Pastor Yvonne for his passion, his commitment, his vision, and for inspiring all of us that uh, within ourselves, each and every one of us, wherever we find ourselves, are the heroes that we're looking for and which our world needs. Thank you very much. Thank you.